courtesy of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, Matt, it's been a busy week for the Flames, but guess what? They clinched a playoff spot. Oh, I know. It's about time. Seven years is a very long time in the wilderness. The seven-year drought is over. Let's talk about how we got there, shall we? Definitely. On March 24th, 2004, the Flames and the Coyotes played. Um, this was a 4 nothing Flames win, which is always nice to see when you can get a shutout. Roman Turk back yeah, in Roman. there for the, for the Flames here. Um, it's been a while. As we know, Noodles was backing up this team for a little while. Nice to see Turk back. Flames get goals from Marcus Nielsen, Craig Conroy, Jerome McGinley, and uh, Marty Jelena. Yeah, the Flames, after losing the previous game against Dallas, it, they needed to put a lot of focus on getting two points as they try to get to that uh, clinching of the playoff spot. And right off the hop, uh, they were going pretty well toe-to-toe with the Coyotes and got a goal 11-11 into the first period uh, by Nilsson. And... Uh, then once the second and third period came on, the Flames just ran over the Coyotes. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was a fun game to watch. It's always a fun game to watch when you dominate like that. Um, you know, and, and really, in this case, your top guys being top guys, right? I mean, that's what you need to see. Jerome needs to be on the board. Craig needs to be on the board. Jelena, great team on the board. I think going into the playoffs, he could be a very impactful piece for the Flames. I agree. Um, I don't know how impactful, but I just get a, a sense here. So we have a back-to-back on the 25th. The Flames and the Sharks are going at it. And uh, unfortunately, this one, the Flames yeah, don't. Yeah, this was a frustrating game. Don't end up you with know, the they, win. like yeah, Especially after they, the night before, right? You got a 4 nothing win. Then you come against the Sharks. And yes, we get goals from Jelena, Saprikin, but it's just it's not enough. No, and you, know, you go down 2 nothing in the second period. And you battle all the way back to tie it in the third with uh, only four minutes remaining. And you look like you're heading to overtime. And then Vincent Danfu scores with like 24 seconds left in the game. And, you know, blowing it uh, before getting at least the one point in overtime. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I thought at some points here. I mean, the Flames, yeah, they got two against them in the second, but... I don't know. I didn't feel like they were fully out of it there, but it, it's it's frustrating. I think they were in this for most of the game. Near the end, it just it didn't work out. Yeah, and you know the late penalty that Conroy took against uh, Chichu, uh, the goal was scored right at the end of the penalty, so it was not a power play goal, but it might as well have been. And just disappointing way for that one to turn out. Yeah, it sure was. It was. Uh, yeah, not what we want to see as Flames fans. Those were both road games. The Flames then came home on Saturday night, the 27th, uh, March 27th, 2004, and they were playing against the LA Kings at home, Hockey Night in Canada game. This one, better result, kind of the flip of the last one, a 3-2 overtime win for the Flames. Chris Simon back in the lineup gets the first goal for the Flames, then Craig Conroy and Sean Donovan also scoring. Donovan gets that overtime winner. Yeah, it was a solid contest. Uh, Huey did a very good job for the Kings. I thought he was the difference maker and the reason why the Kings got a point in this game. Uh, But the Flames, you know, are tracking ever closer to a playoff spot at this point and got their 90th point on the season. And, you know, it's been a long time since the Flames have had 90 points in a year. It's uh, it's been a weird year, and Sean Donovan is 18th. We're going to talk about him later. He's having a heck of a season. Oh, I know. It, just a stellar season, and you need players like that to come out of the woodwork and just have a career year. Uh, you know, that's a big reason why the Flames are where they are, right? I mean, even Chris Simon, the 17th goal in this one, he's not a guy who's known for scoring close to 20 goals a year. No, he had that one really good year with Washington, Other than that, he's just been a solid and steady depth player, and he's come in ever since the Flames acquired him and played adequately in whichever role that the Flames have put him in. For sure. And uh, capping off the week the way it started, taking on the 
Coyotes exactly one week after the road game. They play here. Three three day break. They were off the 28th, 29th, 30th, and then on the 31st, the Flames and the Coyotes here at the Dome. Um, March 31st, 2004, Calgary Flames win one nothing against the Phoenix Coyotes, and this game clinches their playoff berth. Jerome McGinley gets his 40th of the year. I think it's kind of apt that he gets number 40 on the day they clinch. The Pengrove Saddle Dome was ecstatic here. Yeah, and he's, he's tracking to be a contender for the Rocket Richard this year, and uh, along with Ilya Kovalchuk and uh, Rick Nash, they're all closing in uh, on first, and it'll be interesting how that comes down uh, over the next week uh, to see um, who might win that trophy. Uh, but uh, Mika Kiprasov played excellently, made 27 saves in the win, and for the first time in seven years, the Flames are headed to the postseason. What a feeling, Matt. I mean, it's it's been a long time for us here in Calgary. It's been a long time since the Pengrove style dome has had any, you know, NHL playoff hockey. I, I'm excited. Yeah. yeah, and like I managed to get, uh, the Flames were offering that game pack uh, thing at, for buying a game pack or seasons uh, next season. And so I did manage to score myself some playoff tickets, and I'm looking forward to two or three games um, in the next couple of weeks and actually being in attendance. Yeah, we got uh, two regular season games and then playoffs. We'll talk in a little bit here. We have no idea who they're taking on, but we'll talk about some options. But before we do, I just wanted to go back to Shane Donovan. I mean, this is a guy that, you know, has played in the league for a while. He's been really in the league since 94, 95. Um, you know, this season he's 29, still a very young guy, 42 points right now, 18 goals, 24 assists. This is by far his best season. Before this was uh, 2000, 2001, when he played with Atlanta, he had 23 points. What I mean, do you think it's, it's just the fact that he's, uh, you know, he's playing a bigger role with the Flames? What do you think is the, I guess, the big difference here? Well, as uh, former Flame Mike Vernon uh, used to describe his stick handling, it was like he was trying to skate with a puck in a bucket. Uh, so he was never really the m most fluid of uh, players. But everything just seems to have uh, come together right now and uh, for him. And he and his new line mates, Marcus Nilsson and Billy Niemann, have just had instant chemistry and are all looking even better than they would have normally. This been is really one of those separately. lines. That's the sum of its parts or better than the yeah. sum of its parts. Yeah. Cause all three of them are playing like high quality second line players, both offensively and defensively. And uh, Donovan and Eminen are being the two wrecking balls and Nelson's providing the good two way play uh so that way those two guys can create havoc and they're causing all sorts of turnovers and it's leading to good scoring chances and plenty of goals yeah it's uh it's definitely great to see that that's really what you what you want to be seeing out of a line here and you know going to the playoffs that's definitely what the what they really need well, especially with the foot speed of all three of the guys that, you know, it's hard for the defending players uh, because, like, all three of them are in on you and, you know, you're given very little time and space to actually separate uh, the puck from the oncoming forward. And, you know, they kind of look like sharks in the uh, smelling blood in the water where they're just, you know, on you and... Yeah, you know, it doesn't take much for a puck to be turned over, and you know they're so good together that it causes a lot of good scoring chances off of what should have been normally like nothing plays. I think a big part of this too is he's played every game so far. Like he's he's played in all seventy nine games, which even the year that he got his twenty three points, only played sixty three of those games. So, you know, the fact that he's staying healthy and he's able to play, I think that's really helping his production as well. Yeah. Well, um, talking about Sean Donovan, we talked about some of these other guys, Matt. As we know, it's just past the trade deadline here in 2004. The Flames have been making some interesting maneuvers 
um, in the last month. Why don't we check in on some of these young guys that the Flames brought in, and even some old guys, but some new faces. How's that sound? Yep. March 8th, the Calgary Flames made a deal with the Florida Panthers, trading their 2004 second rounder for Marcus Nielsen. And here's a guy I think has made an immediate impact on this team. Yeah, the Flames realistically only had a couple of center options. And, um, you know, when you have Stefan Yell, uh, Matthew Lombardi, and uh, Craig Conroy as your main centers, and then not very much else beyond that, it's hard to, you know, go into a playoff situation with only three centers. And Nilsson has provided a lot of stability for the team and allowing the Flames to properly lo- roll four lines and has played well and fit in like a glove with both Donovan and Neimanen. Yeah, I mean, he's he's not having a, a great season points-wise, I guess, but he's fitting in exactly where the Flames need him to be. Exactly. You know, and coming from Florida, uh, probably a very different change coming to Calgary in March from Florida weather. But, um, you know, you sometimes see guys like that, especially coming from the east to the west, needing some time to adjust and whatnot. I'm really pleased that he's he's jumped right into uh, right into the lineup and made an immediate impact. Well, it also helps going from a bottom feeder team like the Florida Panthers to a team that's actually going to the postseason. That's and- true. Yeah. Yeah, it it makes you know it makes it a lot easier for you to get up for games when it's getting to the point where you're actually going to be going to the playoffs. And really, that's what you want as a player, right? You want to get moved. I think if you're going to get moved to the deadline, you want to go to a team that has a playoff shot. Normally, you're not getting that call to come to Calgary, but this year, that's got to be a welcomed call. Yep. The other trade, and we talked about him earlier, Chris Simon. The Flames traded um, big trade here. I'm not quite sure what to think of it. Still, you know, we've had almost a month to think about this, but on March 6, 2004, the Flames traded Noodles, Jamie McLennan, their backup goaltender, Blair Betts, and Greg Moore to the New York Rangers for Chris Simon as seventh. And I like Chris Simon. I know that, you know, they probably need to move Noodles because Turek's back now. But even, I mean, Betts, I think there was something there. What do you think of this one? Well, it's one of those where, you know, you need to trade depth for a better player and um the flames you know like moving Blair Betts like he was playing very adequately as the fourth line center and more uh, looks like he might be an NHL or moving forward but you know it's kind of up in the air and when you have three goaltenders you know McLennan as well as he's played for the flames and how much everybody likes him you know what I don't think anybody expected Kiprasov to go off as much as he has this year and you know he like he's on the verge of breaking an NHL record for uh lowest goals against average and save best save percentage um you know so it, it's one of those where you know you just don't need three guys and as much as it's disappointing to see someone like Noodles go uh getting a what should be a pivotal piece for this team uh, heading into the postseason uh, makes a huge difference. What a weird goaltending system we've had, though. I mean, coming into this season, who would have expected Mika Kiprasov, who they acquired late in the season, to come in and, you know, look as good as he has? I mean, you know, we've used a lot of goalies this year. Kiprasov, Noodles, Turek, uh, Danny Sabarin. Um, you know, I, I would have expected Noodles, Turek to kind of be the guys they'd ride. And Kiprasov's really come out of nowhere. Yeah, well, injuries uh, and opportunities because of injuries end up, uh, you know, causing situations where you need to find somebody to play. And, you know, and Kiprasov seems to just have been buried behind two really good goaltenders in San Jose and he just needed a shot. And, yeah, he he's taken that ball and running with it. This him. Chris Simon deal, <clears throat> I don't think is a deal that former GM Craig Button would have made. This is very much a deal that the new GM, Daryl Sutter, has his fingerprints all over. Yeah, you need big and tough, especially in the postseason. And Simon is a bit of a wrecking ball and certainly can hit and fight with the best of them, so... Yeah, I mean, we've already got Christoph Oliwa, right? Most teams don't have a couple of these guys, but 
Um, you know, the- well, well, especially like the difference between Simon and Oli was that uh, Simon's can also chip in 15, 20 goals where Oliwa, like he might get a goal in the playoffs if he plays, but you know, he only gets like one or two goals a season. So, you know, Simon's a more regular contributor who also can fight with the best of them. Yeah, it's true. And then we talked about Ville Niemann as well. Uh, Ville Niemann came over a little bit earlier than the other guys, February 24th, 2004 from Chicago for Jason Morgan and a conditional sixth. And, um, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think there's much to Jason Morgan. I think this is a good deal. I, th- I don't know how long Neiman and will stay in town, but I think for a team that's poised for the postseason, I think sort of like the Nielsen deal, this is the right deal for right now. Yeah, and he is a little wrecking ball. Uh, I'm surprised at how good he's played with us thus far. Um, definitely... Uh, character on the ice he kind of looks like the, a real life version of the joker out there and you know uh, with his weird smile he has as he's chasing after people and yeah it it, it it's interesting and the instant chemistry he uh nelson and donovan have is just something special yeah, and you know, as we talked about, Don, you know, Donovan's been having a good year so far. I think even better since February twenty fourth when Niemann came in. They just really seem to complement each other. Yeah, and you know, really, all three of those guys. I mean, we've seen Nielsen and Niemann playing a lot with Donovan on that kind of third line for the Flames this year uh, since they've all come in, which has been less than a month. But like we said, that whole line just really clicking and and getting the best of each other. And Matt, I think we'd be remiss to talk about where the Flames are at and the fact they've clinched a spot in the 2004 playoffs without talking about some of the young guys that made this happen and some of the young guys that, you know, are a big part of the Flames roster this year. So why don't we go from uh, youngest to oldest? We'll talk about all the guys that are in 24. The guy who's worn two numbers this season, number 49 and number 18, Matthew Lombardi. I, I think a lot of expectations for Matthew Lombardi here. Um, we know that he was a, a seventh round pick 215th overall in the 2000 entry draft re-entered the draft and went third round 90th overall in the 2002 entry draft by the flames. What do you think of what we're seeing from Lombardi? Uh, wheels galore. Uh, he Kid is can move. one. Yeah. He is one of the fastest players in the NHL. Um, the only knock on him is that uh, his hands don't seem to move as fast as uh, his feet do, but you know he can really catch people off guard because uh, you think that you got time and space, and then he's already passed you and has a breakaway. And you know it'll be interesting to see how he pr- proceeds, but uh, he is looking like he'll be a fixture for this team for a long time. Yeah, I mean he's got you know 16 goals, 13 assists, 29 total points. The I guess the only thing I worry about a little bit is the 32 penalty minutes that he's got. And some of these seem like he's just kind of trying to play. I imagine the way Daryl Sutter's trying to get this team to play. Some of them, though, just seem like undisciplined penalties. Oh, and that's true of most young players. Uh, you know, you, you take some stick infractions that you shouldn't do, and you learn. And there's very little, I think, to complain about Lombardi at this point. Like, it, you know, you just hope that he can learn to improve his offensive ability to go along with his uh, gift of speed that he has. I know we've got some really good rookies this year. Andrew Raycroft, Michael Ryder, Trent Hunter, John Michael Lyles. Do you think that uh, Matthew Lombardi's anywhere in that Calder Memorial Trophy discussion? Uh, possibly, but I don't think he is going to be a finalist. No, I, I, I mean, I think we like him. We see him a lot here. He's doing a lot for our team. But I agree with you. I'm not sure that he's, you know, a guy that when we look at the impact across the league, he's having that. Mm-hmm. Um, another guy here, uh, the the next youngest, we're in number seven, a right winger, also 21, Chuck Kobasu. Chuck Kobasu was the Flames' first round 14th overall pick in the 2001 entry draft. And this is, uh, he's been, he's, he's played a few games here. He played uh, 23 games last season. Um, splitting his time in the NHL and AHL. This year is really his first time playing a full season here. He's got six goals, 11 assists, 17 total points. This is a guy that I think has some durability. I think he's going to be around the league for a while. What do you think of him? 
Yeah, he's looking like a responsible enough two-way player. Um, the offense just hasn't translated yet to the NHL level. Um, but, you know, his whole game, he's looking like an NHL player. It's just where he he fits eventually uh, will, you know, it will just depend on if his offensive game translates fully or not. Yeah, I mean... There's flashes all the time, it's just... Yeah, I mean, I think this guy's capable of a 40-plus point season on the right team, but I don't know, I just... I think consistency, like you said, and, and, you know, becoming that consistent NHLer is really going to be the most important thing here. Yeah. Um, 22 years old, Oleg Saprikin, their first round pick in 1999. He's, he's a, he was their 11th overall pick. Um, coming into the team this year, Saprikin is wearing number 19 and not having a bad season so far. I mean, he's been with this team for a while. He's not a rookie. He's played games as far back as 99, 2000. But I'd say the, I mean, last year he had a full time spot. This year, doing really well. Um, what do you think of Saprikin? Uh, he's certainly falling into the full time NHLer uh, role, and he's looking like a quality second, third line player on most teams. Um, good enough two way play. And, um, just wish that he'd stop shooting the puck from the corners, though. It just seems like such a low percentage shot, but yet he keeps doing it. You know, That's I don't know enough. I, I don't him. know enough. The only thing I can think is maybe with the bigger ice he's used to back home in Russia, that that's a more viable play. Yeah, it just seems like a bit of a wasted shot. But, you know, he does score on occasion from there, but it's, you know, it's like skate towards the center a bit, then shoot it. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I'm. I I think he's got third line potential, but unless he stops doing stuff like that, I don't know how long his uh, his NHL career is going to be. Well, he, you know, he's looking like an NHL regular now, so we'll see. It, you know, he it's one of those where it, it'll be interesting to see if he can figure out how to score at the NHL level on a more consistent basis because he has all the tools and the size and the speed. It's just uh, not sure if he'll put it all together because he could be a 25-30 goal scorer if he puts it all together. It's just not quite clicking quite yet. I think we could say the same of the next guy too. This is a guy that came over from uh, San Jose, so obviously the guy Daryl Sutter liked. Worry number 20 is Lynn Loins, uh, came over this year. He's played uh, not even pretty much about a handful of games, actually about 10 games at this point, and he has two points. Yeah, he's a quality 13th forward, and he'll fill in if there's injuries. But, um, you know, as much as uh, we like, uh, you know, the Burning Loins uh, nickname, it, he, he's just there. He's a filler guy, and we'll see. He's the kind of uh, guy I think is going to get a lot of uh, jumps between the NHL and the AHL in his career. Yeah, your prototypical 13th forward. So, Matt, we, we talked earlier. We've had a lot of uh, goaltenders playing this year, four goalies. Um, Danny Sabarin, kind of a weird case. Uh, fourth, fourth round pick, 108th overall for this team. He's played... His, you know, fair share of games at uh, the QMJHL, the ECHL level, the AHL level, um, now getting a bit of a shot in the NHL, played four games for us this year. Do you think this guy's got an NHL future? Do you think this is going to be a career minor leaguer? What do you think? Well, he didn't look terrible. Um, and I think he would have gotten more of an opportunity with this team had it not been been for Kiprasov coming in and blowing the doors off. Yeah, if Kipper didn't get airlifted in from the Sharks, I think you're totally right. I think he probably would have been as as terrible as the, as the pair sounds, Noodles and Sabarin as our, as our pair this year. Yeah, and you know, like, especially with Turk being hurt, and you know, it would have likely been Noodles and Sabarin, but uh, when Noodles got hurt as well, uh, right before we acquired uh, Kiprasov, you know, like it, there was no situation where having Sabarin as our starting goaltender for an extended period of time made any sense. So, like, it made entire sense to go out and get Kiprasov, and it's 
you know, much to Sabarin's detriment, uh, Kiprasov just blew the doors off of things and, you know, it, it, uh, like, I do not foresee him having an opportunity with this club moving forward just because of the fact that Kipper has gone into god mode and, you know, well, and, you just kind of ride that dragon as long as you can. Yeah, and who knows what Kipper looks like next year. I mean, we've seen a lot of goaltenders that look good for one year and, you know, don't follow it up. So who knows if this is a good year for Kippersoff. Maybe Kippersoff is, you know, a gem that, um, that you know, nobody's found. I don't know how good this guy is. If it's one year, if there's going to be a guy that 20 years from now we're raising the rafters of the Saldome, I have no idea. But, um, you know, I don't know that Danny Sabarin is going to learn a lot backing him up if he's a starter. I think this guy really probably needs to go back to the HL a little bit, polish his game, and maybe play for a, a bad team where he can get some more starts. Yeah, exactly. Because Kipper seems to be able to start, like, every game. And, again, if that if that happens again, you're giving this guy 10 starts, I, I don't know how viable that is. No, and realistically, like, if, you know, Kiprasov does play the majority of the games, um, you know, like, it, you're going to have to just cycle in veteran backups like uh, uh, McLennan, where, you know, you have somebody who's used to playing once or twice a month, not, you know, like, two out of every six games. And, you know, well, we can talk more about the goalies when we talk about the playoffs, but that's a worry I have about Roman Turek is this a guy who's used to playing regularly. I don't know how well he's going to do if he's sitting on the bench behind Mika Kiprasov. Well, he looked good in the Coyotes game earlier this week, getting the shutout, so it's kind of hard to say. Yeah. Um, Let's move to the back end. Two more guys here we'll talk about. Uh, The last two, and these are two defensemen. One of them is Robin Regeer. He's uh, currently 23 years old. Um, played for this team for a while. I mean, we've we've seen him really play NHL minutes since the. And he has not looked good up until this season. Like, it, and I think uh, the crafty acquisition of uh, Rhett Warner um, from Buffalo uh, for the Chris Drury in the and Ryan Precht in the Chris Drury trade uh, was huge for this team and Regeer has learned a lot of what it takes to be a good defensive defenseman from Warner, from Daryl Sutter. And, you know, like he's on a different level than he was last year. And And this is why it's important to have veterans on your team. Yeah. Especially like to have young guys like Regeer, uh, you know, and learning from a guy who's been to the cup finals a couple of times in Warner, you know, you, you need to have, guys like that as quality teachers so that way they know how to play in certain situations and Regeer's just taken his game to another level this year and is really cementing himself as one of the top defensive defensemen in the NHL I agree I mean he's been around this team since not you know since the 99 2000 season but like you said really hasn't broken out and I think Sort of like we talked about with Kipper stuff. I don't know if this kid can really break out or not. Um, I don't know what his future's got. He's 23, still very young. But, you know, I have to imagine with with uh, him, if he can keep this up and if he can learn from this, I think that he could be in Norris contention in the future. Possibly. Um, you know, good season so far. Like you said, I think Warner's done a lot for him. Right, Warner's the guy I think we're going to hear a lot from going forward. Um, I, I think he could be really an unsung part of this organization and getting a lot out of, of Regeer. And, and that's what we need in a year like this. Mm-hmm. And the last guy we'll talk about um, is Jordan Leopold, the guy they call Leo. He's He was actually drafted by Anaheim in 99. Again, a guy who's been around the league for a while with the Flames, uh, started here in 2002 in the at the NHL level. And... Um, now his offensive game has really taken a step forward this year. It has. Yeah, it, it sure has. I mean, you know, he's, he looked like a good defenseman last year, I'd say, you know, but much more of a, a defensive defenseman. And I think that was one of the knocks on him is he needed a better offensive game. Well, and you know, having a guy like Tony Lidman, uh, to be uh, there as well, um, helps him just to learn a quality two-way play and you know he's put up a, a number quite a number of points this year as a defenseman but you know he's playing very well with Regeer and that that pairing seems to like the uh, Neiman and Nelson Donovan line it seems to be 
like their chemistry is elevating them higher than either of them is individually. Yeah, and you know, I mean, he played three games last year with the St. John Flames, uh, most of the year with the Flames. I guess the Calgary Flames. But, you know, this is a guy, as we've talked about in the past, who came from college to the NHL. That's always a tough jump, but I think he's making that jump well. Yep. And that's that's not something that you always you always see from these young guys. So um, good to see all those young players. I, I think, really, the energy of these young guys is really what's propelled the Flames to where they are today. I agree. I think if you would have had a lot of the guys that were here, you know, when Button was here or some of the veterans you often see, I mean, you know, these guys are really part of a a resurgence here for the Flames. And I'm so glad that Daryl Sutter has, you know, brought in Neiman and Simon, Nielsen, guys like that, Warner, to compliment them. But if these guys are going to have any success in the 2004 playoffs, they really need these young guys to step up and keep playing the way they have. I agree. And uh, that brings us to the playoffs, Matt. So looking ahead to the first round. Who would have thought not only the Flames would be in it, but that we'd be in it and have so many possibilities for who we could be facing here? I know. There's four teams to choose from, and it's like, okay, which team are we going to lose to? <laughs> you know, like, because, like... Pick your poison, all, right? Yeah, all four of them are dynamite teams. Detroit Red Wings are the Detroit Red Wings. Like, they're an amazing team. The Colorado Avalanche, you know, you have Joe Sackick, Peter Forsberg, Milan Hayduk, Alex Tangay, Paul Correa, Timu Solani. It's just like, shoot me now. <laughs> and then, you know, Vancouver and San Jose are both very stacked teams as well. Like, it's going to be tough against no matter who. And, you know, frankly, like, I, I'm figuring that regardless of our opponent, it's going to be maybe a five or six game series and then we're going home for the year. But yeah. And and I, you know, I hope these young guys cherish those five games because I don't know this team is built for another playoff run next year, the way they are now. I think this might be a bit of a flash in the pan. Um, We don't even know if there's going to be hockey next year and what that might look like with, you know, the lockout and all that that's pending um, or pending lockout, you know, negotiations, all that sort of thing. If that'll be, nothing if resolved be, or not yeah be a half season like the last one if that'll be a full season what that looks like but i really hope these guys take it as a learning experience yeah and you know like you have a goalie like kiprasov and like as good as he's been you know like is he going to be this player next year and you know that it does happen where you have guys that are awesome and then they just stay awesome uh, like Dominic Hasek was a backup for uh, Chicago for a number of years. And Wasn't then he went Belfort's to Buffalo. backup? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, like he was just okay. Then he went to Buffalo and became Dominic Hasek. And, uh, you know, and then you have guys like um, Jim Carrey, who, you know, was great for two seasons and then vanished from the earth after that off and making movies now they're different guys yeah, yeah. and you know it, it's just odd um so you never know uh with goaltenders they're kind of just voodoo <laughs> and you, you you got a good one you just hope that it stays and you know so frankly like this might be the flames best opportunity to make some noise in the playoffs especially with all the chemistry that all the players have with each other but it, it's going to be a, a hard uh, series regardless. And, you know, like even if they win one series, it's like, okay, well, you beat Team X, then you're going to have to beat Team Y. Running the gauntlet Z. of these four teams. I mean, like, that's it, like, that's impossible, isn't it? Yeah, like, it, it, you know, like it would be one thing to say beat Vancouver. But then, you know, like you're going to have to play either San Jose or Detroit or Colorado. And then you'll have to w- play another one like that in the, the next round. Like, you know, and then if you get to the finals, like, it's going to be a god team from the other side. Like, it's just going to be a ridiculous gong show. Like, there's no way that this team, you know, like, it, it should just be happy with two or three games at home in the Saddle Dome. It'll be fun and, you know, hope for another one. <laughs> just, Sometime before the next seven years. Yeah, exactly. And just enjoy and cherish the fact that, hey, there's playoffs for the first time in seven years, and 
hopefully this is just the start of something. If you had that, to rank these from, I guess, least painful to most painful, what would your list of teams you'd want the Flames to go against be? Well, the team that I'm hoping for in the first round is Vancouver, just because of the fact that, frankly, you know, as much as, like, Vancouver is a very well-built team, you know, if we end up facing Colorado in the first round, like, they're neck and neck in the standings, and, you know, if we play Colorado, that's not going to be easy. Like, Timu Solani has our number and has had it for, like, his entire career, and he always seems to score one or two goals against us every game. So, like, I really don't see the Flames beating Colorado. So if the Flames even want to get a chance out of round one, I think Vancouver is the way to go. Vancouver's still got a lot of firepower, though. I mean, Naslin, well, Brandon well, Morrison, Bert Todd Bertuzzi, well, the Twins. Well, Bertuzzi's out for the year because of uh, being suspended. So Does that the apply Flames to the playoffs would, as well? Yes. So, like, he's... It's one of those where, like, the Flames will have a little bit of an easier time with Vancouver but it's not going to be an easy time against Vancouver. Like, we're likely going to lose in six or seven. Like, I don't see us moving on from there. The but. thing that worries me about Vancouver is the amount of shot chances they can get from the blue line. I mean, Brent Sopel, um, Matthias Oland, Sammy Salo, Ed Jovanovski. Like, these guys have a lot of puck movers on that blue line, and I don't know, oh, I know. if the Flames are ready for that. No, and it's going to be a... Uh, you know, like, I'm not having any expectations of actually beating Vancouver if we match up against them, but it'll, like it's going to be a war to get through each of the games. And, you know, it, you just have to hope that you can grind out a win here and there and hope that your total ends up to be four. And, you know, it's not going to be easy, though. It's not. And, you know, again, I mean, that those top guys, Nasland, Morrison... Uh, Sedins, that's a tough group to go against. Wouldn't I've always liked Brendan Morrison? I'd uh, it'd be interesting if this guy ever ends up in Calgary. Well, there's lots of high quality players on Vancouver that I wouldn't be uh, disappointed that if they ever became Flames. But you know, it, it'll be interesting to see. So it's Vancouver's just... your your uh, number one team you want to face. Who's number two? Uh, probably the San Jose Sharks, just because I don't think that they're as good as either of Detroit or Colorado. Um, the Bokoff scares me, frankly. Um, like, there's a reason why San Jose was okay with trading Kiprasov, because the Bokoff is the real deal. Um, well, and even Vesa Toskala, I mean, you know, yeah. he's had a good season as a backup, too. Yeah, and it's one of those where the Flames... Like, they're basically hooped, regardless of who they play. Like, the Red Wings are so deep with so many Hall of Famers on their roster that, you know, like, it, it's not going to, you know, like, that's going to be, like, a four or five game series, like, if the Flames meet Detroit. Like, that, it's not realistic. The only ones that I think they might have a shot against are Vancouver or San Jose. But even then, like, it's going to not be likely, and it'll be hell getting through. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even looking at the San Jose roster, right? I mean, we got Patrick Marlowe, Nils Ekman, Jonathan Chichu, their young prospect, Alan McCauley, uh, Marco Strum, Vincent Damfus, who we talked about earlier, Brad Stewart, Wayne Primo, Scott Thornton. Like, this is a, this is a lineup, unlike the Flames, is built for the playoffs. Yeah, and you look at you know, say Detroit, like, you know, they've got Hatcher, Schneider, Shanahan, Iserman, you know, like, like all of these teams are so ridiculously good. Like, yeah, I mean, you were you talking know, like, about Detroit, right? I mean, Datsuk, Brett Hull, Brennan Shanahan, Iserman, Matthew Schneider, Zetterberg, Ray Whitney, Chris Draper, Lindholm, Maltby, Holmstrom. I mean, even a guy like Steve Thomas, Chris Chelios, Yari Fisher, like they've, this is, this is pretty much your, this could be an all-star team. Oh, I know. And like, they're the best team in the West for a reason. And yeah, it'll be like, it's important for the flames to come out, um, in, uh, the last couple of games of the year and try to cement a position that's higher than seventh or eighth, <laughs> just because, you know, You're like, get crushed. Real, 
yeah, you're gonna get absolutely destroyed, uh, regardless of, like, if you're playing Detroit or San Jose, like, you're not likely gonna win either of those series, and, you know, um, Vancouver is probably the only one that you have a possibility of winning, and even then it's gonna be very tough, and Colorado, you're pretty much hooped. <laughs> Well, let's talk about Colorado. I mean, they've got Joe Sacking now, who's plus 80 points. Alex Tangay, a guy I would love to see have a long run with the Flames at some point. I don't know if it's feasible, but, um, I, uh, you know. Well, he, he did score here. those two goals in uh, Game 7 of the 0-1 Finals, uh, the only two goals in that game. So, you know, like, he definitely can come in in the clutch. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see if the Flames I mean, can you know, ever get a guy like that. Yeah, but. I don't know. I don't know what it would take. That's the only thing. Yeah. Um, Milan Hageduk, Peter Forsberg, Rob Blake, Connor Walchuk, Korea, Solani, Lyles, Foot, uh, Derek Morris, former Flames pick. Um, you know, he, he, yeah, like their only weakness is uh, David Abisher is nowhere near the goaltender as Patrick Waugh, and. <sighs> Even then, like the, you know, it's one of those that group ahead of Abisher is so good that yeah, I think know, he's good uh, enough. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, his like, backup Philip Sove is no better, and we've even seen Tommy Salo play some games for them. I mean, that's not an option anymore. No. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm most scared of Detroit, and I'm most scared of uh, Colorado. Yeah, I don't know just which too one many I'm... offensive weapons. Yeah, like it, it. Realistically, though, like it's likely going to be a five or six game series, and then the Flames will go home with at least the happiness that they got to the playoffs for the first time in seven years, and they just get to start golfing a couple weeks later. Yep, and we'll see how it goes, but you know it'll be a lot of fun, and I'm sure that the Sea of Red will be. Very enthusiastic, uh, starting uh, in game three. Yeah, I mean, there, there's really no way at this point that we start at home. No. So, you know, whatever it is, it'll be games three, four in Calgary, and then it'd be... Game six if necessary. Six if necessary, yeah. So the most we can get is those three, um, but we're... And then you just hope for another one or two after that. Yeah. Um, I guess, I think the Flames' big playoff... I guess hopes are going to roll are going to ride on their goaltenders. We've seen Mika Kiprusov come in this year since Daryl brought him in. We've seen him look really good. Do you think that this is a guy that can, you know, steal a couple games in the playoffs for the flames? Like this, this run has got a, I guess this run of amazing play has to stop at some point, right? Well, you know, goaltenders are the thing that can derail good team seasons. And, like, in 1993, the Montreal Canadiens were nowhere near a favorite to win the Stanley Cup, and Patrick Waugh just said, yeah, it's mine, I don't care, and <laughs> basically won that cup by himself. Um, you know, and, like, winning 13 games in overtime that year, and, you know, it, it a goaltender can, you know, if you can't score on them, you will eventually win the game. <laughs> so, you know, if Kiprasov stands on his head like we've seen for the balance of this season, you know, the Flames might be able to steal a round or two just because he goes into God mode and the Flames have enough talent on this team where they can chip in a few goals here and there. You know, it's... Sometimes that might just be enough, but I'd love to see you know. the Flames beat the Sharks just so that uh, Kiprasov can rub their noses in it. Yeah, that would to, be a lot of fun. Yeah, um, I don't think we'll get that far. I, you know, I yeah, we could match up with them in round one. It just yeah, depends I, I, on how yeah, the final it, it week depends. Goes. It's not what I'm guessing is going to happen. No, and you know, I mean, Mika Kiprasov's looking really good here. But as we've talked about, this is a guy who was a third string goal when we brought him in, like. What is the upside? Do you think this – we've really been searching for number one goalie since Mike Vernon, you know, Trevor Kidd, those guys. Do you think this is a guy that is – kind of has a good season and then goes back to being Turk or somebody else's backup next year? Do you think this is a uh, goaltender that will be here for a while? What do you think, you know, the the likelihood is 20 years from now in 2024 that they raise his number of the rafters? 
Well, if he plays like this for the rest of his career, then yeah. But that's it. Like, what's the likelihood of there, right? Well, you know, you just kind of have to take it one season at a time. And, you know, he will determine through his play what happens with him. And, like, the Flames will have him as their starting goaltender for as long as he is amazing. I mean, I didn't even know this guy existed coming into this season. No, like, you know, you have to be pretty deep into the depth charts of other teams to know, you know, guys like Kiprasov. And, Especially you know, San Jose, Darryl, two goalies I think could both be starters. Yeah, and Daryl um, being very intimately aware of their organization knew what he had there in Kiprasov. And, you know, he pulled a sneaky sneaky on uh, the Sharks and the Flames are huge winners from that trade. And. You know, Could be. I mean, regard, regardless, it, it'll, it'll of, depend on what the Sharks know, turn that second rounder into. Well, even if they get a really good defenseman or forward from that that plays for him for ten years, like it, you know, like if Kiprasov plays like he has, uh, you know, and continues to be an excellent starting goaltender, it won't matter who that player is. The Flames will win this trade in the landslide. We've seen Roman Turk hurt for most of the year, now back as I guess the backup. Weird thing to say. How much do you think Roman Turek is going to be relied on for the Flames in the playoffs? Do you think Kiprasov gets, let's say it's a five or six game series, gets all six? Do you think that we, you know, we'll see Turek in there at all? Well, we saw a couple, like last year with um, Carolina, how they used Arthur Zerbe and Kevin Weeks and would kind of like whenever one got cold, they'd throw the other guy in. And And I think with all the teams we're talking about, they've all got two viable goalies. I mean, yeah, and like the Flames do have the benefit of having the best backup of any of the playoff teams. Like Roman Turk could be a starting. Oh, I thought you meant Danny Savard. Yeah, but you know, having uh, Turk in there as the backup, you know, like you know, he could carry a series by himself. Like, and he has played well before, and you know, he was a very good goaltender with the St. Louis Blues. So before and. Played well in the postseason in those ga- games as well. So it's one of those where, you know, like if Kiprasov slows down for whatever reason or starts having a bad stretch of games, you could throw Turek in as a viable replacement to kind of try and switch your fortunes. Yeah, I mean, in uh, 2001, he played, Turek played 14 playoff games of the Blues, um, had a, pretty much two goals against average. And, I mean, that's pretty good for the playoffs. And then the year before, seven with a 2.75 goals against average. So, um, 9, 5, and 0 in 2000, 2001. And in 99, 2003, 4, and 0. You know, you, I think you need to go with the playoff experience. And it's going to be really interesting to see if Daryl will continue to ride Mika Kiprasov or if he'll go with the proven sort of veteran playoff guy come game one. Who would you be putting in the net? Well, I think you ride Kiprasov until he plays poorly. Uh, and even if you're going all the way to Stanley Cup Finals, I think you ride Kipper until he falters. And if he does, and like he has a really bad game or two, and like there's enough time in the series, then I think you could swap over for Turk. Like, say the Flames go ta- down 2-1 to one in a series uh, with Kipper playing poorly in two, you could throw Turek out for game four in that hypothetical to try and reset things. But, uh, you know, we'll see. I don't foresee anybody but Kipper getting the net as a, as the starter. He might get pulled here and yeah, there. Yeah, and I think you've be. got to have a short leash on him. Like, if he's not looking good, put the veteran in. Yeah. Even though Turek hasn't looked great this season and coming off his injury, he's the proven veteran guy there. Outside the goalies, Matt, obviously, you know, Jerome Ginla needs to have a great um, postseason. But anybody, you know, anybody here that you think really needs to step up? Anybody you think is going to surprise in the postseason for us? Well, I, I think in the playoffs, you need your veteran guys to carry the day. And, you know, guys that have been there before, like your Rhett Warners, uh, like your Chris Simons, like your Martin Shellina like your Craig Conroy's, like all of those guys have been to the playoffs m- multiple times. Um, you know, again, needs to learn how to be the leader on a playoff team. Like he did start his NHL career in the playoffs, but you know, and then has been there for seven years. So like, this is his first real opportunity as a leader on a team. Uh, so between like 
the uh, the couple of forwards and you know some of the veteran defensemen. Uh, you know, I think those are the guys that you're going to be needed to be relied on to carry this team and hope that the youth and uh, the scrappiness of the the Nilsson line uh, carry the day. Yeah, you know, I think when we look at some of those older guys, I mean, you know, like you said, we've got you know Conroy is going to need to step up there. Um, even a guy like Dean McCammon, I think, is going to have to step up. I have a, I don't know why, but I have a feeling here that Marty Jelena is probably going to play a bigger role in this playoff run than we think he's going to. I don't know why. Just he, he's a veteran guy. He seems to have his positioning right. I wouldn't be surprised if the Flames make it out of round one if this is the guy who is scoring a pivotal goal there. Yeah. Well, and uh, I'm just got to pause here for a second. Uh, the, uh, McCammon wasn't eligible to play uh, for us in the playoffs that year or that the year uh, got after the trade. Back? That, yes. Okay. So, All right. Well, let's go through that again then. Yeah. Why don't we just redo the whole thing about, uh, we'll do the whole thing about who's. See, it, it's so many like McCammon's been here and back, and I get confused by timelines way back then. Yeah. Just uh, start from the Jelena part uh, forward and just, you know. You know, I think a guy that might surprise here, Matt, Marty Jelena. Like, this is a guy who's a proven NHLer. He's, you know, an older guy in this team. He's had a good season. He's done what he's expected to do. But I don't know why. I just think that if the Flames make it out of round one, Jelena is going to be a big part of that team. Well, and he's scored a couple of pivotal goals in the past. Uh, I think he uh, scored a series winning goal with Vancouver. I think he might have had one with LA, or Edmonton uh, in his rookie year. Um, in 1990 when they won the cup. Um, so, uh, we'll see. Um, you know, he seems to be one of those guys who elevates his game in the playoffs. And I, you know, there's a lot of guys that need to show a lot in this playoffs. If the flames want to move past the first round. For sure. It's, you know, and I think like we talked about all those young guys, um, Jerome definitely needs to be the guy that's going to carry this team outside of Kiprasov. If Jerome doesn't have a great playoff, they're going nowhere. Yeah. I don't even exactly. think they get five games out of this. No. And realistically, it's going to be a all hands on deck for <laughs> if the flames want to do anything really. And need all 20 players skating in the same direction, pulling the same way. Uh, because if you just look on raw talent, um, you know, like the Flames are not as good as Any all of, of the teams. other four teams. Like, you know, you just look at the number of Hall of Famers that are on each of those teams. Like, you know, like it's, you know, you're not going to be having an easy time with any of them realistically. So, you know, like it's one of those where, uh, you know, the Flames are going to have their work cut out for them. And thankfully that they've got a coach that knows everything about hard work. That's right. And you know, for Jerome to do well, Craig Conroy has got to do well. I mean, these guys seem to be a pairing here. Um, you know, one doesn't often do really well without the other. So, you know, I think if, if we're going to see the flames do anything here, Craig Conroy is going to need to step up just like a Ginla. Oh, I agree. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see another how good hardworking of, guy. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how everybody plays uh, once the games actually matter. Craig Conroy, I mean, Matt, he's he's in his thirties now. He's what thirty two. I mean, this is a hardworking guy. This is a guy that I think a lot of fans love here. Wouldn't it be? Wouldn't it be? I mean, I don't know. He seems to love Calgary too. Like he's played in a lot of places. He he seems to really like Calgary. This is a guy well spoken, seems to know the game. It would be crazy if 20 years from now he was the GM here, son, wouldn't it? Well, you know, when teams hire uh, their uh, alumni, it tends to not go too well. So hopefully he bucks the trend if that ever happens. You know, it'd be even more crazy if he was the GM. Jerome was one of his assistants. Okay, you're getting into fantasy land here. Knock it off. I'm, imagine if Jelena was working for the team and, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just hire the whole team. That's right. Yeah, sure. Dave Lowry yeah. could be a head coach at some point. Um, it'd be, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, go away now. <laughs> <laughs> They'd have to hire Reggie at that point, too. I don't know if he'd, where he'd fit in the office. But, um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be crazy if, you know, 
20 years from now, some of these guys were still a big part of this organization in other ways. Yeah. Well, lots of hockey to be I played mean, between hey, now Lanny's and Hey, still kicking around, right? True. Not on the ice, but, you know, what what Flames event do we have that Lanny's not kicking around for? Oh, exactly. So, I think we both agreed Vancouver is our desired opponent here. San Jose second. And but, yeah, realistically, it's, yeah, <laughs> no matter who, we're basically hooped. I guess I'm just looking at who we're going to be embarrassed by the least. Like, if we go Colorado True. or Detroit, we're yeah. we're going to be out of the Saddle Dome after two home games. Yeah, exactly. I'm just hoping for a third one. Well, that's, um, that's it. And I, I don't even think you get to game five against Colorado or Detroit. Maybe San Jose. I think Vancouver's your your best bet here to not be embarrassed. Sure. I, Realistically, Vancouver's the only team I could see the Flames beating possibly yeah and, and and you know with the with the distance i could see a lot of flames fans actually going over to vancouver for those first couple games too true um yeah i don't know it's it's scary to think about any any of these teams yeah they're just so good so it'll be fun regardless and I, i'm sure that everybody's going to be partying regardless of how far this goes Enjoy it while it's there, because it might be a while till it comes back. Yep. Um, well, Matt, we've got two more home games before we get there. Let's look ahead to the next week for the Flames. On on April 2nd, they're going to be at home taking on the LA Kings. Um, I'm still not used to this weird Kings logo, this uh, crown. I'm so used to that thing that they wore. I don't even know what you call that shape when Gretzky was there. So, um yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure I like the current Kings look. And then on the fourth, they close out the season at the Dome against the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. What are you thinking for these two games? Uh, Well, um, the Flames don't tend to do well uh, in Anaheim. Uh, that They just seem to always oh, yeah, lose against the These are both away Ducks. games. Never mind. I read the schedule wrong. Yeah, so like it, it's very difficult to win in the Honda Center. For whatever reason, it doesn't matter if they're bad and we're good. We're good and they're bad. Whatever, like it, it just, yeah. Like it, regardless, the Flames always lose in Anaheim, so I'm gonna say a loss on that one. And uh, they need the two points, so I'll go with the win against the Kings. This is really a weird road trip. Like they played, they they played um, last week. They played the Coyotes and the Sharks on the road. Then they came home and took on LA and Phoenix here. And then they're going on the road again, back to California. It's such a weird kind of week. Yeah. It's like you couldn't have just swap some of those games. Around well, that's, and, That would make the most sense. Wouldn't it? Like just keep them in California and then play the last two games at home. Yeah. I, I'd have to look. I don't, the know, if, I don't know if the hitmen are using is, the arena or what's going on. Yeah. The scheduling is always bizarre. <laughs> so like I, I, I don't recall a season where it's not bizarre. <laughs> so, you know, and the yeah. <laughs> Just um, logic, you know, is out the window. Like, oh, let's travel all this way, all the way down to the other side of the continent and then come all the way back. Just to go right back. Like, it, it, very well, dumb. And if they play San Jose, pretty much just stay there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's or or, you know, go all the way over to Detroit. So it, it could it could be a very weird couple of weeks. What was your prediction for this week, sorry? Uh win against LA, a loss against Anaheim. Just because we always suck in the Honda yeah, Center. Yeah, you you know the Honda Center is gonna be a loss, don't you? Um Yeah, I I think the, the Ducks have to be a loss. <clears throat> I'm not sure what to predict for the LA game. Um I'll go loss. I'm gonna I, I don't know. I, I don't know the Flames roll with the momentum they need going into the playoffs. Yeah, and realistically, you know, we do have a bit of a cushion on uh, the teams behind us. Uh, like, we're currently sixth. I don't think we can catch uh, Dallas nope. uh, for fifth. But, you know, it could happen. But I think it it's one of those where you need them to lose out and us to win out. And I think we're just, you know treading water above uh, the 7th and 8th place teams, and we'll see. Who do you put in goal for these? Do you rest Kippersoft? Do you play Kippersoft? I think you got to just run with Kipper all the way. 
Do you think you sit anybody? Uh, possibly in the last game. Depends on if anybody's banged up. Yeah, I, I think, like you said, the Flames are at a point where they're barely hanging on to six. I think you got to run the full lineup and, and just secure those points. All right, well, Matt, that uh, brings us to the end of our show. We will talk to everybody next week after the after the Ducks game, and hopefully we'll have more clarity on who they play in the playoffs, and we'll get ready for round one. Yep, and uh, as always, go Flames, go. So April Fool's to everybody. This is an episode we've wanted to do for a long time, sort of recapping a, a week some point from the 2004 season, considering that our show comes out on Mondays, and Monday happens to be the first this year, as well being the 20th anniversary. We thought this would be a great week to do it. And Matt, that was a lot of fun. I'm curious how many people are still listening when they were just talking about Donovan and, you know, Conroy and thought, what? I downloaded the wrong episode. So hopefully everybody enjoyed that. I know Matt and I did. And we will be back next week to, to go back to the present and talk about the 2004 season. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.